Check one.
Everybody's here already. Well, here we go. All right, am I on? Am I on? Hey, good evening. We're starting a little bit early. Usually there's a countdown uh, before we start live streaming. But when you leave me back with the kids, as long as you did this morning, we come up with harebrained schemes. So this was the kids' idea, actually. They wanted to teach you guys one of our favorite songs that we sing in, uh, in Zone 11 Junior Church. And we do this, sometimes we do it in choir, but this is mostly a, a Zone 11 song. If you've been in church any time at all, you've probably heard this song, I Love Him Better Every Day, right? Close by his side, I will abide. I love him better every day, right? All right, so we want you to help us, okay? But we put our kid twist on it. We'll sing it regular and we'll spell it out to begin with. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate, right? Huh? Well, we spell it. I love him better than D-A-Y. But then we do it first time football style. Well, first time normal, second time Third time, cheerleader. football style, and then cheerleader. Oh, pastor. Sorry. Let's pray. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I was telling everybody, pastor, when you leave me back with the kids as long as you did this morning, we come up with harebrained schemes. So this is a harebrained scheme. You know the song. Sing it along with us. But then when we do the football style, yeah, go ahead and jump in. And cheerleader style, I think, is their favorite because they like seeing me do it. All right, so, all right, let, let's jump in. Ready? I love him better every day. I love him better every day. Close by his SID. I will a B I D. I love him better every day. Football style. I love him better every day. There's a lot more where that came from. Not tonight. So, <laughs> some of you are going to get up and leave. No, 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 that, not, not any more of that tonight. If you would stand with me, though, uh, we're going to sing three choruses tonight. The first one is, He is Exalted. He is Exalted. Well, let's... Jesus is the sweetest name I know. That, 
that's the next one. So she's not wrong. I, I heard that and I'm like, uh, yeah, that, oh, I did pick that up. Oh, wait, what? Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Let's do that again. Ready? Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Nina Volk, if you're going to come in and make fun of me, I'm going to have you come up here and help me sing. Okay, yeah, okay, no, no. She just did that, so. <clears throat> There's something about that name, the one we, she was starting to play. Just lift your voices. Ready? Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. I really wish each of you could hear yourselves from up here. Beautiful. Pastor. Well, we've had a great day so far this morning. We had a lot of visitors here, and uh, it's good having our missionary glad. He's 21. <laughs> He's young, but he's got a vision, and God's uh, going to use him in a great way. And uh, our church, we, we uh, gave him $2,000 this morning, and then someone came to him and wrote another check for $2,000, so he had $4,000, and then somebody in the parking lot just, he told me, he said, handed him a wad of money, and he didn't even know how much it was, so... So God, uh, he was glad uh, to be in the house of the Lord. 
And, um, and then someone uh, is giving him an acoustic guitar, and someone else is giving him a keyboard. And so uh, God uh, was here blessing him today, and uh, <coughs> he, he's, he's, uh, he's, going, he's speaking at a different, another church this evening, but we went out with him today and had a good time. So we, had a, we had visitors, many visitors here this morning. Good crowd here this evening. God's good. All the time. God is good. Someone can bring me a, uh, this water's been here pretty long. Somebody, and then someone check the air back here. It seems a little warm to me, a little stuffy. So, Ezekiel, chapter 4. Strange. <laughs> Strange book, I would say. Um, uh, when I say that, I, uh, you'll understand what I mean in a moment. I've never preached through the book of Ezekiel before, and so it's a very interesting. Uh, maybe it's a better word than the, the word strange, but uh, God called Ezekiel back in chapters 2 and 3 to go preach to the Israelites who were taking, taken into captivity to Babylon. And Jeremiah was a prophet contemporary with Ezekiel, also Daniel. So he begins to preach. And unusual sermons he had to preach. In fact, he was called to act out his sermon. They didn't have flannel graph, evidently back then, or PowerPoints, or none of these things. And so because the children of Israel were so wicked, he was going to give them a visual message. Begin with me in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. God tells him what to preach, and his sermon was not really a, a verbal message, but a, a picture. He would act his sermon out. Verses 1 and 2. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile. Uh, this was a, uh, a tile made out of clay or earth. That had been, it was a tile that you could write on or draw pictures on, different than anything we would have today. Take this, he says, and lay it out before thee. Probably I would estimate a good size. And he says, on it portray or picture or illustrate upon it the city. Which city? The city of Jerusalem. That's the city. This is the focus of, thank you, this is the focus of his message. Well, Jerusalem, uh, the city of Jerusalem, the Israelites, many of them had been already deported, but there were some still back in Jerusalem. Here's the focus. What was going to happen back in Jerusalem? And he, he's preaching this message and drawing this and, pick, and, and bringing objects out, and he was acting it out before the people, probably not too far from his home, and they would gather around and watch and, and see what he's talking about there in Babylon. But what would be the future of Jerusalem back home, several hundred miles away? So they're watching him preach this, this uh, sermon. He says, you go and you portray, you show, you picture, you draw the city of Jerusalem, lay it out on this earthen tile. In verse 2, and lay siege against it. You draw this and you lay this city out, Jerusalem, and 
And you, you, you play, play act uh, a game of war. And you make it look like armies are coming against this city to lay siege against it. Build a fort. Anybody ever build a fort when you were a kid? Ever, anybody ever play with army men or G.I. Joes or any of that kind of stuff? You know, uh, when I was a little boy, I used to do that. Go out in the backyard and find a, a hill of dirt and make caves and, or, or whatever. And, uh, and so he, he's, he's kind of acting out a, a war, but the war is against the city of Jerusalem. So what, what does he bring to help illustrate? Well, it says, build a fort against it and cast a mount against it and set the camp against it and set battering rams against it. What's the, what's the phrase over and over and over that I just mentioned? Against it, against it, against it, against it. Believe it or not, God was against his own people. That's, they were in a sad predicament. It was all because of their sin. And God says, I'm coming against the city of Jerusalem, the city of God. Even Mount Zion, uh, in the Psalms, uh, it would say, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion in the sides of the north the city of our great king? If you have been to Israel, you've been able to see the city of Jerusalem. You know, the city of Jerusalem is the focal point of the world today. And the things that will happen in the future in the Bible. But at this particular time, uh, somewhere about, uh, my mind is not clear for sure, but somewhere around, I believe it's 597 B.C., so uh, almost 600 years before Christ is what we're dealing with here. So he's, you ever play the game Risk? Anybody ever played that before? You know what I'm talking about, where you, you have battles and you try to take over the world? He, he's having, uh, uh, playing a, a board game, in a sense, out on a clay a tablet and drawing things and setting up props to make it look like the city of Jerusalem, but yet it's being sieged. Or it's being be, besieged. They're, the enemy has surrounded the city, and he's acting it all out. And they're watching him. It would be like me just being quiet for a moment and start doing things, and you're watching to figure out and trying to figure out. And I'm sure he maybe said a few things here and there, but for the most part, he's, he's illustrating what would happen. So he's planning before them the occupation or the takeover of Jerusalem. That would happen about 10, 10 or 11 years later in 586 B.C. Now, Babylon had already taken so many people, and, but yet the city itself was still functioning and uh, the temple was still there. But in 586 B.C., just a few, a few years down the road, Babylon would go against the city, and this time the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed, leveled, the temple would be destroyed. And so this is the sermon that Ezekiel is preaching. Hey, it's not going to get any better. Things are going to, in fact, get much worse, and you can only imagine their hard-heartedness now receiving a a, a, a negative type sermon and uh, let me put this down a little bit here and so you would think that maybe they would want to listen to somebody who would preach a positive message are there people whoops not going to do that are there people like that today 
that just want to hear, give me, give me a positive message. Well, in fact, most of the prophets in the Old Testament didn't have positive messages. They were preaching judgment. Get right with God because it's going to get, things are going to get worse. And so he began to sketch out a drawing or a model of the city of Jerusalem on the clay brick slab that was in front of him to picture it. And I'm sure the hearts of the people that were there in Babylon longed for that city, and yet he says, yet he's showing that it's going to be destroyed. And so he puts the, the wall around it. He puts the armies around it. They're battering ramps that would come against the city and, and, and the, the ladders and so forth that would come up over it. Maybe you had a few catapults here and there and uh, uh, other parts of the battle that would take place. And they're all gathered around watching him make this portrayal of the future event. <clears throat> Later on in the book of Ezekiel, we will see that Ezekiel saw not only this near future, but even into beyond our time. What he's acting out, he's depicting the destruction of Jerusalem in just a few years from his day in 586 B.C. What a message. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. It's going to be taken over completely by the Babylonians. Now look at verse 3. Ezekiel 4.3 he gave him uh, another illustration. He says, okay, now, moreover, take unto thee an iron pan, uh, a, a, a vessel, that, much like what the priests would use uh, in their everyday uh, operations. Take this, take this, uh, this pan-like skillet or a griddle, flat griddle, and he says, make it a wall. There you have the city. Now put this, put this uh, griddle-type barrier between, between yourself and the city. He says, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city. Now this is made of iron. This was an obstacle. And he says, and set thy face against it. So he was to put this barrier between his face and the, the, the model of the city of Jerusalem. And notice what, what uh, Ezekiel is told. God says, it shall be besieged. It will be attacked. And thou shalt lay siege against it. When you act this out, act like it's being attacked, taken over. He says, this shall be a sign to the house of Israel. This is, this is a warning, this is a depiction of God's judgment against the city of Jerusalem and his people. So he gets down there and puts this this griddle, this barrier made of iron between him and this makeshift city before him. And it was showing that he was actually acting as God. In other words, God says, there's something between my people and me, and it's a barrier. Do you know what that barrier was? The sins, the abominations, the wickedness, of God's people separated Ezekiel, uh, God from his people, and Ezekiel is portraying that right before their faces. This iron pan symbolized the wall that stood between God and his sinful nation, Israel. God could no longer look at his people. In a sense, he had to withdraw his blessings. God was not uh, pleased with the Jewish people, and he took away his approval from them. The Bible says that our, our sins separate us from God's presence. 
continual rebellion brought this picture. Good to see Fred and Blanche back here. I, I just noticed them. I snuck in. Good to see them this evening. What God was saying through Ezekiel is that, hey, you, you've made this bed. Now you're going to have to lie in it. God's not going to withdraw his judgment for 70 years. That's what happened. God says, you're going to face judgment, and they did, and they would. Verses 4 and 5, he tells him to do something else now. He says, okay, <clears throat> lie thou also upon thy left side. He stretches out, maybe, maybe it was in the direction of, of, the, of, of where Jerusalem was and where Babylon was. I'm I don't know that for sure, but he lays down on his left side, explicit instructions given by God. And he says, and, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. He was like being the priest that was taking the sins of the people. And he says, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. Verse 5, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity. According to the number of the days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Can you imagine? If I got down every day, which he didn't have to stay on his side forever because we know he's going to have to go ahead and prepare food, and do other things. But every day for 390 days, that's over a year, he had to lay down out in front of the people on his left side. Doesn't tell us how long he stayed there, but long enough to where they got the message. So he, can you imagine preaching a message for over a year? <laughs> Whew, that's a long message. To be able, every day coming back, and you'd think pretty soon they would get that message. What in the world's he doing down there on his side? I was going to act it out here, and, but I'd have to get somebody to help me get out probably. <laughs> but on his left side, he would recline, and in a sense, he was bearing the sins of the people for 390 uh, days, which represented 300 days. 90 years of their wickedness, which most Bible scholars believe began with the separation or the division of the kingdom of God in, into the, uh, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, and started with, with Rehoboam, and it ended with the last king, Zedekiah, and if you add up those years, it comes up to somewhere around 390 years of wickedness of the sins, the wicked kings of Israel. It represents their sin. The whole picture that Ezekiel is giving is that you have done this in the past, now you're having to pay for your sin. Verse 6. And when thou hast accomplished them, after a year and a month or so, then you turn over on your other side. Part two of the sermon. You lie again on, your right, on, on thy right side, thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. So, for 40 days. So his message is to both Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah. We know that the northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken into captivity back in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. Now the Babylonians are coming 
uh, going to come in 586 and destroy Jerusalem. And so he's portraying all of the, the sinful years. You had you had the 390 years to 40 years, and you get how many years? 430 years. Now, many Bible scholars believe that the, the 40 days or 40 years represent the preaching of the prophet Jeremiah when he began preaching until the time that he was done, his ministry, that those were specifically to the uh, to the nation, the Jewish nation, the, the tribes of tribe of Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom. So first, he mentions it's an illustration of the sinful kings and and those of of, of the nation Israel, and then more more currently, the years of Judah. Each day representing a year verse 7 and 8. Thou, therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege or the attack of Jerusalem. Then he was to take his, his robe or whatever he was wearing and pull it all back and, and his arm was to be uncovered. In other words, it was to be loosed and freed from any clothing and and laid out there, he says, Thine arm shall be uncovered, bare, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. And so, to further illustrate it, the the bearing of the arm and it to be tied or bound, so that means that it would it would not be changed. God's judgment, his the, the strong arm of God would be would reach out toward Jerusalem being uh, unhindered. In other words, God's judgment was going to flow, his wrath, the strength, the strong arm of God was reached out toward the city of Jerusalem, and nothing could sway his wrath. So he does this. <laughs> Several days he's there and he's stretching his arm out toward, toward the city showing that God is against Israel. Verse 9. Another part, another part of the sermon illustration Ezekiel was told to do. Verse 9, take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches. These six elements represented uh, poverty. He says, put them in one vessel and, and make the bread. Make bread. Are y'all ready to make some bread? Bring it. And, and what, he, what he's bringing in there is just poor people's food. Bring, bring it all, throw it all together. Now, the good bread in the Bible days would be wheat, pure wheat, fine wheat. Bring in some honey. And, 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 and oh man, that would be great bread. But here he says, he says, you throw in all of these scrap things, and this is what the future is going to be like when food is rationed. Just a few late few days later. I was going to bring one of these loaves of bread out of our freezer and I, I forgot. And I told my wife, Oh, I was gonna bring that. He says, we have, notice, Ezekiel 4, 9, there's Ezekiel bread. Anybody ever eaten that before? And we have some in our, in our freezer there, and uh, my wife likes it. It tastes good, but you know what? And, and, and whoever came up with this company to, to uh, 
product, uh, make this a product there, they went back to this very passage and said, well, we want to make it healthy, we want to make this and that. And they had these ingredients. There's different types, I believe, of Ezekiel bread. But they take these ingredients and they try to make it and make it a, and my wife says it tastes really good. I, I don't know. I think I had it one time. I don't know. But it's supposed to be healthy. But, you know, let me just stop for a moment. The Ezekiel bread that's well packaged and wrapped today and it's made, you know, and it tastes good and all that, that's not the kind of bread that's mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. In fact, the message that Ezekiel is being given by God is that you're going to have to eat not the leftovers, the scrap type of bread, the poor man's bread. When Babylon would come against Jerusalem, and destroy them. There wouldn't be hardly anything to eat. And he says, I want you to eat this bread for a long period of time in front of the people. We know that he had to get up and make this bread uh, so he wasn't on his sides forever. And so God gives him this task to be a baker. You never know what God's going to ask a preacher to do, Right? You'd eat the bread if I made it. Are y'all awake out there? Uh, So it's not the same thing, quite the same. Although it's based, the bread that you, he had to get this bread and make it and put it in a basket. and, And it wasn't, let me tell you right now, it was no gourmet meal at all. We went out with a missionary today and they came out and they had this nice, loaf of bread down there at that, uh, what's that, Longhorn Steakhouse, and they come out, and I got the knife and sliced it up, and man, that was so good, put a little butter on it, and that's not what Ezekiel was told to make. Man, it was, it was not good. He, the picture here is that things are, are not going to be good in the, in the future for the nation Israel, in particular, the city of Jerusalem. It will be a time of famine. Not any sweet, normal bread. This is going to be a lot different. And you show the people. You preach to them and show them visually. Notice (coughs) chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And thy meat, or when you see that word, it means food. And thy meat, thy food which thou shalt eat, shall be by weight. It's going to be weighed out. You're only going to get so much, a little bit, every day. Twenty shekels a day, from time to time, shalt thou eat. Verse 11, thou shalt drink also water by measure. Water by measure. The sixth part of an hen from time to time thou shalt drink. Only a only certain amount of water. Only a certain amount of bread. The people during the siege of Jerusalem in a few years down the road they would have. They would be, what's, what's the message? Well, you're going to get thirsty. You're going to be hungry. You're going to basically almost starve to death. You'll have about eight ounces of bread per day and just a couple of cups of water or a pint of water for the whole day. I just spilled that all on myself. I spent, I spent, I just spilt, if I was in the Bible days there, I would have just, I would have said, oh no, spilt just a couple of drops, but that would have been a lot. Think of verses 12 and 13. And and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes. You, you, You make the best out of it, but now notice this. Oh, 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 oh. Be careful. This is gross. Ah, This is awful. 
Thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man. Human feces. You, you will bake it and that will be your fire. You'll take dried up human feces and then you'll bake the, the bread. Ah, can you imagine? Ah, oh, that's awful. That's, that's not a pretty picture. There's not any bread that I'd want to be eating. Now later on, God's going to say, well, we'll, we'll change that. Ezekiel goes, boy, he says, well, you're just, now you can bake it, Ezekiel, with just uh, dried up cow patties. You know what a cow patty is? Cow manure, cow dung. He says, well, I'll let you use that instead. And you can use that for your charcoal underneath baking that cake. Whoa, man, do it in their sight. And the Lord says, even, said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their, what kind of bread? Does it say delicious bread? What does it say? Defiled bread. Where are they going to eat it? Among the Gentiles. This will be an awful situation. He said, whether I will drive them. You'll, uh, this is all a picture of what would happen and in the future, when Babylon would come and bring destruction and havoc against the city of Jerusalem. During the siege in 586 B.C., the Jewish people would not be able to follow a kosher diet like they were used to. This would be totally different. What a detestable thing. To be able to eat the bread of a poor person that the fire was started with dried up cow manure. Ugh. Defiled bread because you are a defiled people. Can you imagine? He would eat that bread in front of them. For months. I'm sure I, I, th I thought, well, I bet he was glad when that sermon was over. <laughs> wow. Where do you think he went after that sermon? He went down to the Long Corner Stank House. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. That, that's, that's a tough sermon. To be, and he has to act it out. What was going to happen? Look at verse 14. Then notice what he says. As he goes, Oh, Lord God! Behold, my soul hath not been polluted. I've not done anything like this before. I'm a priest, God. For from my youth up until now, I have not eaten of that which, did, which dieth of itself or is torn in pieces. Neither came there abominable, abominable flesh into my mouth. He says, I have never done anything like this before. God. And that's when God says, okay, well, you can just use the dried up dung from a, from a cow instead. Look in chapter 5, verse 1. Then he continues on to preach this, these messages to the children of Israel. He says, now I'll tell you what you need to do. Take, thou son of man, take thee a sharp knife. Actually, the wording here in the Hebrew is, is more like a sword, a long knife, a sword. Uh, I don't know how many of you cut your hair with a sword, but this, was, this is a, a speaking of God's judgment, and he would actually bring the sword against them says, take, the sh take a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head. Cut the hair of your head, and, and also upon thy beard. This was a shameful act for a priest to cut his hair and his beard. And here he, he has to do it before the people. And then he says, 
to Ezekiel, take the hair that you've cut and put it in three different areas and, and three different balances and weigh them out equally in three different parts. It says, take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. So he had to carefully weigh the amount of hair that he took off of his head and his beard. And God, I'll go ahead and just summarize, God says, you burn a third of it, burn it up. Another third, you chop it up again, chop it up with a sword. Then another third, you let it blow away in the wind. And so it's a picture of, of showing the uh, a total chaotic judgment that God will bring upon all the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem through the hand of the Babylonians. This is going to be, you're going to be blown away, you're going to be killed, you're going to be, it's going to, many people are going to die, it's going to be, the city's going to be burned and the temple will be destroyed. What an awful picture. And he says, but you keep a few of the hairs and put them in, in your, your, your clothing and keep a remnant back And yet that remnant will even suffer great persecution. This is not going to be a fun time. And why? All because of the people's sin. Look at verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord God, this is what? This is Jerusalem. This is what will happen. I have sat, I have set in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness. They rejected the word of God. His judgment, his reasoning, what God had to say, thus saith the Lord. They had rejected him. He says, and she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than what? More than the nation. You mean Israel had become worse than Babylon? <laughs> yes. You mean they were just as into idol worship as those in Babylon? Yes. They were even worse. And my statutes, they, they rejected and changed my statutes. They changed my judgments. They changed my word, you might say, more than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes they have not walked in them. Sad portrayal of the people of God. A visual message of suffering and judgment that was to follow. All because of the sins of Israel. As I begin to think of this, how in the world could God's people be worse than the world around them? I began to think about the United States of America. Could it happen here? Could it happen that God would have to judge our country? The one who has been so blessed that we sing God bless America and yet we begin to see it crumbling apart before our very eyes. People changing the word of God. People not walking in the will of God. People against God. We better be careful 
Ezekiel may be, in a sense, <laughs> if he were today, he might be called by God to make a model of our country. If God, listen to me now, if God would bring judgment against his chosen people, do you think he would bring judgment against you and me in our country? Oh, surely that's not going to happen. Interesting that in prophecy you don't really find any clear mention of the United States down the road. But this wasn't the very end. There was more. Babylon would come against Jerusalem in even a worse way that you can even imagine. Look at verse 10. Skip down to verse 10. Notice what it, the famine would be so bad and the people would grow so despicable. It says, therefore the father shall eat the sons. And the sons shall eat their fathers. And I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Food will become, would become so scarce that people would begin to eat one another. That's, that's, that's rough. Uh, that's a, that's a, not a pretty picture at all. That's, that's disgusting. Jeremiah, who was a preacher during this time, also mentioned the siege that would come against Jerusalem. And look at Lamentations in chapter 4, verse 10. Notice what he says about it. The hands of the pitiful women, those who were kind and merciful and compassionate, even, even their own hands have sodden their own children. They, they would boil their own babies, Jeremiah says. Ha! Ah! They were their meat, their food in the destruction of the daughter of my people. How low can you get? What a depraved and disgusting situation Israel would eventually bring upon themselves. And notice as we close this evening, look at a couple of last verses here of this chapter. Verse 13, notice what God says. Notice how he sums it up. God says, thus shall mine anger be accomplished. And I will cause my fury to rest upon them. And I will be comforted. And they shall know that the Lord has spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury in them. As I begin to, th to think of this back that happened way back centuries ago and it finally this did happen and God judged Israel through those 70 years, but specifically during this uh, attack on the city of Jerusalem, the Bible speaks of a future time, a tribulation period, seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble, yet again, more severe, when God will one day pour his wrath out upon this earth mentioned, Jesus talked about it. John the Revelator mentions it. The judgment of God. The wrath of God. God says, this is my fury. This is my wrath. This is my judgment. I certainly don't want to be around for that day. The day of God's ultimate wrath. God's ultimate fury, God's ultimate anger. 
Look at verses 16 and 17, the last two verses we look at here in chapter 5. God says, when I shall send upon them the evil arrows of what? Famine, which shall be for their destruction or death. And, will, and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you. And will break your staff of bread. Verse 17, so will I send upon you famine and evil beasts. And they shall bereave thee, and notice what else, and pestilence, pestilence, and blood shall pass through thee. And I will bring the sword upon thee, I the Lord have spoken it. Wow. Wow. Not a pleasant, easy, good feel sermon that Ezekiel was called to preach. Jesus spoke about the same things there in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. About war. About famine. About pestilence. And about death. In the future well as John revealing that in the book of Revelation. These things one day will be much worse than the siege upon Jerusalem. He was a man who was called to be a watchman of Israel to give warning for future judgment that was to come. God is a holy God. We better make sure we're living right, doing right, and pleasing God because our sins separate us from Him. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. An interesting preacher Ezekiel was. An interesting call from God to visually act out his sermon giving warnings of judgment. How can we apply that to our lives this evening? Well, make sure that you are living and pleasing and walking in the way of God today in your life. Pray for our country. Pray for Israel. They are there amongst all the countries and nations of the world today. And yet one day we know that they will turn back to God as a nation Judgment's coming one day. Make sure you know where you're going when you die. And, and one thing we can know for sure is whatever God says, thus saith the Lord, we better take it to heart. Listen to the word of God. Realize that we have to face God one day and we better be ready. Make sure that you know God. Make sure that you have him in your heart. Make sure that you're serving him and doing what he wants you to do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, uh, I've, what, what a, an unusual, uh, what unusual illustrations and sermons you told Ezekiel to give. Because of the hardness of the people's heart. Because they did not want to listen. They did not want to obey. God, help us to be obedient people this evening. Lord, I pray for our country. I pray for our nation. God, may, may we never end up like Jerusalem did. Lord, help us to be a part of the remnant <coughs> that are standing up. Lord, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we see a pandemic. We see viruses. We see shortages of 
uh, of things even recently, and yet, God, we know that this is nothing compared to what lies ahead for those who are against you. So, God, help us to be for you. Help us to be on your side. Lord, I pray for somebody here this evening that might be lost. They might not be sure they're saved. I pray if that's the case, they would get right with you tonight. And God, help us to take living the Christian life seriously. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're not going to have an invitation, but... uh, you want to come make a couple announcements? Uh, you go ahead and be seated just for a minute. But just uh, take it to heart, the Word of God, as you leave today. Good evening. It is crazy delightful outside. We're, me and the teens were used to that 110 degrees out in California. And like today, it was like nice and breezy. It was shady. I was like, wow, this is really nice. I love it out here. And I look at my car and it says it's 83. I'm like, this is great. I love 83 degrees. This is perfect. Uh, thank you once again to everybody for the prayers for the youth group. Uh, I'm sorry this morning went a little long. Sterling decided to preach a sermon instead of the five minutes that he told me he was going to do. So I know, amen. <laughs> sorry, Sterling. It was good. Uh, but it was a blessing hearing just those few testimonies. There was a total of 11 of us, well, 11 teens that went. So uh, all of them were affected and changed in some sort of way. Uh, A few of you asked for my point of view on the whole uh, youth camp. And like Allison said, I went in there expecting for just the teens to be changed, knowing I'd I'd probably get a good sermon notes here and there from all the great speakers. But instead, God really changed my heart uh, at the conference, uh, at conference, youth camp. Uh, It was like Thursday or Friday. I think, yeah, it was Friday, our last day. And all week I've been praying, Lord, change the heart of my teens. I see some of them raise their hands that they're convicted of something, but none of them will go out and pray. Maybe one or two, the ones that I expected, will go out and pray, you know, with their counselor, but no one made any big decisions. No one's like, yep, I'm called to be a missionary. No one's like, yep, I'm going to get saved. Nothing like that. It's just, yep, pray for me. And I started getting a little, ugh, in my heart. Like, Lord, what's wrong with them? (laughs) Why are they such sick sinners, Lord? (laughs) You know, I'm getting angry. And then Friday night, um, one of the guys, I used to, at Lancaster, Alice and I were heavily involved. I taught a 10th grade uh, guys class, and I was a counselor for Lancaster Baptist teen camp. And this guy that I taught back three, four years ago pulled me aside. He goes, hey, Brother John, uh, Lord led me to write this for you uh, and just let you know how much you mean to me. And I kind of puzzled look at him because, like, I recognized the face, but I had no idea who this kid was, like, at all. I mean, in my class, I had 50 teens of just 10th grade guys, massive. So I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then I looked at it, and it's written by David, uh, David Kim. Brother Kim is the uh, Asian Ministries pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church. Well, it's his son. Uh, and, he wrote, and he wrote me this letter, and it just about brought me to tears because I was humbled. Uh, and, and you'll see why in a second. It says, Dear John Eady, he spelled John wrong and he spelled Eddie wrong, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, and he goes, uh, Dear John Eddie, hello, Brother John Eddie. <laughs> the Lord just laid on my heart to write you this letter. All I want to say is thank you so much for your incredible influence you have personally made in my life. You've been the most sincere counselor and teacher I have ever been under in my entire life. Heaven will tell, you, tell uh, how much God used you in my life. God gets all the glory and thank you for the light in your uh, light in your life and testimony, which, man, his handwriting is bad as mine, which shines the spotlight onto Christ and his glory. You've been such an encouragement from 10th grade to now seeing you still faithful in serving our Savior. I can sense and clearly see the difference-making compassion with, your, uh, with, with which you exhibit to your teen group. Thank you so much once again for all that you did for us. I recently went to teen camp as a counselor uh, in June this year, and I remember you taking uh, taking our cabin to a mini hiking trail and getting real with us. I did the exact same thing, and by God's grace, four people accepted Christ. Three got right with their authority, and one got rid of their lust. I'm forever grateful, 
and may God bless you. And at first I can feel like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah, I did that. How, how awesome am I? But rather I took it and I'm like, John, you fool. I only had this kid seven months. I don't even remember his name. And he says I'm the greatest impact on him. God, I am nothing. As a lot of the, as a lot of the teens t- said today, God, I lack. I lack understanding. As I'm getting mad at some of the teens for not going forward, they can make decisions right there in their seat. You guys have a huge impact on my youth group. Your giving, it goes far beyond your money. The elderly people that came and spoke to my youth group have a huge impact. Just because teens kind of look at you with this puzzled, like, huh, (laughs) face, doesn't mean they're not getting anything. Lives were changed this past week for the better. And I want to thank every single one of you for that. And please, if you guys are like, oh, nothing really changed, no, something did change. It takes time. Small increments of steps, and those all made possible because of your faithfulness and your giving. Uh, for a couple announcements, uh, Tuesday is our Live Wires potluck. Uh, once again, we're having a cook-off, and everybody will see how great I am of a smoke person. Uh, and then uh, our Saturday church picnic has been bumped all the way to August 28th. Ooh, I got that right. August 28th from 4 to 8. Uh, all the other announcements are in the bulletin. If you guys can, please remember to pray for pastor this week. Three funerals on top of Wednesday. That's a lot. I uh, pray for pastor. pray that he gets time to study for that. Uh, and then other than that, you folks have a great rest of the day. God bless, okay?